On today's episode of the Cryptoverse, what if a mobile app used facial recognition to verify your identity? Well, that's what the Humanic app is aiming to do. Plus, they are planning an ICO. Voltoro is the one-of-a-kind online exchange where you can trade between gold and Bitcoin. Reserves can be audited online at any time and are protected from confiscation and company failure. Sign up for a free account today by checking out the link in the video description below. Hi there guys and welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse, your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. I'm your host, Chris Coney. Today's Monday the 3rd of April 2017. I am having a tough time with my meditation practice right now, so I'm doing my absolute best to pump that energy up for you. Uh, not easy, but I'm doing my best for you. So we're going to get into the market roundup, and then there's some interesting things going on with Segregated Witness, so stick around because that segment's going to be in the show today. So over we go to coinmarketcap.com. So a big weekend for Ripple here, 86% gain in the last 24 hours. But again, today's Monday, which means we don't see the overall gain that Ripple has had over the weekend. It was more like 200% over the weekend. It might have even been slightly more than that. But so since yesterday, it's 86% up on the day. That actually puts a Ripple token at about 5 cents. And it gives it a market cap of 1.77 billion, which is knocking on 2 billion. And that puts Ripple right there in third place by market cap now. Just below that, we have Litecoin with a gain of 19.8%. And that's reclaimed its fourth position after it's been occupied by Dash for the last couple of weeks. Litecoin is now $8.24 a coin, and its market cap is 415 million. That still puts Ripple at like triple the market cap of Litecoin, which is very interesting. And Dash itself has gone the other way, down 20.6%, $55.57 a coin, and now has a market cap of 400 million, which is way, way down from that 700 million that we saw when Dash was around $100 a coin. So looking at that, actually, it's almost nearly halved from that high. Now let's give an honourable mention today to NEM because it is up 16.9% today, uh, putting it at about two cents a coin. And in terms of other crazy moves, we have Doge down here in 14th place, up 47.5%. And like I say, that now ranks in 14th place with a 53 and a, well 53.7-ish market cap. Now you can tell I'm having an off day today because I've even forgot to do my highlights. Apologies for that. But finally for the market roundup, we see down here where's Decred. Decred is in 17th position. It's the biggest loser officially today, beating out Dash with a 24.5% drop, resulting in a coin price of $9.52. So this didn't happen today. It happened over the weekend, but... You might have seen me tweet this out because as soon as I saw this, I thought I'm not going to wait till Monday to actually um, announce it. But on Litecoin's segregated witness tracker here, the percentage has gone up to 58.5%. So I'm looking at my figures here. And the last time I looked at it on Friday, it was 22.64%, which is a huge jump. And also bear in mind, if I bring my cursor back here, 58.52% current current level of support, that's knocking on the target, the actual threshold, of 75%. So it's really not that far off now. And of course, we're assuming that it's going to hold because a miner could revoke their support at any minute. It's just that that was a significant gain. And this is actually the closest that Litecoin has ever been to activating Segregated Witness. So I just thought I'd point that out. There's nothing really that significant going on with Bitcoin scaling, so I'm not going to go through that today. I almost forgot to mention this. I saw this tweet from 
this fellow Wang Chung. And his Twitter handle is at F2Pool underscore Wang Chung. So F2Pool is a, well, a, a mining pool. And it says here, someone hacked the major mining operations and their stratum has been changed to ant pool, blah, blah, blah. So what, what that basically means is that some other mining pools had been hacked and then that mining power pointed towards the F2 pool. It says our hash rate doubled instantly. The reason I'm mentioning this is that I just talked about the sudden jump in support for segregated lit witness on the Litecoin network. And then when I saw this, I, I, haven't, I haven't put these two together yet, but I'm wondering if that inflated support for segregated witness on Litecoin is actually artificial. And it may be the result of this. I don't really know. I've not looked into it, but I figured I'd mention it. So if anyone wants to look into this and then come back to us, I would appreciate it. And then for the new segment today, I've turned to the Coin Telegraph. For this article called Humanic Opens Pre-ICO for Bank Transfers and Updates Their App. Now bear in mind, this has a sponsored label on it. So the author of this article has paid uh, the Coin Telegraph to publish this article. I I had no hand in that. I just find the article interesting anyway. The reason actually I chose this article was I was largely influenced by some of the comments I received on um, some of last week's episodes. You know, sometimes I talk about how proof of individuality in this world of blockchains would actually prevent one individual from creating, say, thousands and thousands of wallets and then corrupting voting systems like proof of stake and all this sort of stuff. Now, the technical term for this is a Sybil attack, but correct me if I'm wrong on that. I believe that's what you call a Sybil attack, where a single individual almost has like split personalities, pretends to be thousands of people on a in a computer network, and then can abuse their influence, if you know what I mean. So the counter to that, to my mind, is if we could somehow verify our individuality, that would bring a level of trust, you know, a level of certainty, and a level of decentralization that is a step above and beyond anything that we have at the moment. And there's still a possibility of a Sybil attack in many of the networks in the blockchain space, so I'm always looking out for solutions to this. So in the comments of those previous videos, someone su suggested that Humanic had potentially solved this problem. So when I saw this headline, I thought it was the perfect opportunity to talk about it. So it says here, Humanic, a revolutionary new mobile application, has announced the launch of its initial coin offering, here and after referred to as ICO, a pre-order fund for bank transfers on their website in order to meet the expected high demand. So this is the other thread that goes throughout this story. This is actually what the main story is about. Their ICO is coming up and they're going to allow bank transfers before the ICO to mitigate any congestion that there might be on the Bitcoin network when the ICO formally launches. So it then goes on to say, the cutting edge product combines the latest biometric, blockchain and mobile technologies in order to bring a new solution to the global problems of providing global financial inclusion and illiteracy that keeps some 2.5 billion people living in poverty. So there's the answer to that fundamental question we always have to ask about a project. What problem does it solve? What, what problem does it aim to solve? And how big of a problem is that? Right, there's a lot of talk about financial inclusion in the blockchain space. And the reason why I think this is important is because including an extra two and a half billion people in the global economic system would actually change the nature of the global economic system. And by that, I mean, it somewhat spreads out and dilutes, you know, the purchasing power uh, over a broader base. Now, of course, that's one phase in an overall process, because if, for example, you live in a country with a totalitarian government, being included in the financial system isn't necessarily going to make that much of a difference, but at least it begins to loosen the grip on centralized bodies of power by giving people more choices. I've highlighted this bit in yellow here that says Humanic CEO Alex Fork. His name is actually Alex Fork, and he's heading up a cryptocurrency project. I just thought that it was funny that his surname was Fork, so I thought I'd point that out. Anyway, moving on here to the green, it says... According to Fork's white paper, more than 3 billion people live on less than $2.5 a day, with around 80% of the population surviving on no more than $10 each day. Now, the main reason I think it's terrible when I hear about how little money these people live on 
is that it doesn't adequately cover basic physical and survival needs. If we take it to the next step though and pretend for a second that everyone in the world has enough money to satisfy, let's call it the bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the honest question which I don't yet have an answer to is, well what then? You know, we, we might not know the answer to that until we actually get there. It's just something I find that my mind does. It's always looking ahead to see where things are going. That's probably why, or what got me involved in cryptocurrencies in the first place. You know, I've read a lot of books on happiness and explains one of the reasons why I'm heavily into meditation. But in terms of material wealth, there's, um, there's this great law of diminishing returns. Like the first, I can't remember the specific number, but it's something like up to and including about ten or fifteen thousand uh, dollars of annual income, the the increase is say from a thousand dollars a year to two thousand to five thousand to ten thousand. The the amount of happiness you get from increasing your material wealth from in those steps, you know, thousand a year to ten thousand to fifteen thousand a year, it the money makes a huge difference to one's level of uh, of happiness. But then once it peaks over something like fifteen thousand dollars a year, you need like massive leaps in wealth to make even the slightest difference to someone's level of happiness. So if you'd have to go from, don't quote me on this, but you'd have to go from like $15,000 a year to maybe 100000 to get even one you know, fraction of a point movement on one's happiness index. Then you might have to go from 100000 a year to a million a year to get another fraction of a point. So beyond $15,000 a year, don't quote me on that, material wealth ceases to have any appreciable impact on one's happiness levels. So what I'm really getting at here is once everyone's got their survival needs satisfied, what happens to the the dissatisfaction that people will continue to feel when material wealth doesn't continue to increase the happiness at the same rate? That's going to be interesting, not just for people in the third world, but for in the developed world, as the whole world gets more wealthy. Um, we're going to have a bit of a culture shock that when we all realize that material wealth isn't actually going to make us feel any better about our lives. Not really. And then we'll have to turn to other sources for fulfillment. But anyway, moving on to the section called App Upgrade. It says the simple to use app utilizes facial recognition for identity management and is aimed at people who don't have access to documentation that traditional banks require. And then Fork, Alex Fork, that's a bit confusing, isn't it? Fork states that the team is working on two tracks, the UI, which is the user interface, and the back end, which is the technical workings of the app. And it says that when you're dealing with users that span 2,000 languages or more, it kind of lends itself to the simplest user interface possible, because the more text and the more instructions that you have to give a user, the bigger the burden in translating it all to those many, many different languages. And then, then we're here, we have like the main benefit of this facial recognition stuff. I was thinking about this problem more from a developed country mindset, but biometrics in this circumstance have removed the need for governments to kind of give identity documents their authority. In this case, your body becomes the authority, or at least your bodily readings from, you know, a facial recognition or fingerprints or whatever, right? And then in terms of dates and the question of when, in the purple here, it says Humanic is planning to release a live version in June or July with a global rollout expected towards the end of 2017. Well, that's pretty quick, wouldn't you say? Between their ICO and a global rollout, that's only like a six month gap. You know, things move pretty quickly in this space. No doubt about that. And then the article signs off by saying that they've opened a third office in London after already opening offices in is it Moscow, and Luxembourg. And of course, their London office places them close to lots of other, you know, financial technology startups, so they can more easily like build relationships and give the Humanic project the best possible chance of success. So thanks for joining me today, guys. If you liked this episode, hit the like button. If you disliked it, hit the dislike button. Please leave me a comment below with some feedback and get subscribed. And please support the Cryptoverse and boost cryptocurrency adoption by going to cryptoversity.com forward slash podcast and becoming a patron. From just a few dollars a month, you can secure Cryptoversity's future, get unlimited access to all Cryptoversity courses, and access a private patrons-only chat group where you get direct access to me. That is all for today, guys. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the Cryptoverse. 
So until then, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.